Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. Philippians, chapter 4. And we've been going over some uh, things in the Bible that are misunderstood. Um, tonight we're going to look at one that's uh, often misunderstood and, and misused uh, verse in particular. Philippians, chapter 4. Look at verse 13 with me. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your word, for preserving it for us, bringing it into uh, English for us in a, in a trustworthy translation, not just a version, not somebody's thought about what you were trying to say, uh, but the actual words that you said translated into English. We pray that tonight as we study it, your Holy Spirit would guide us, give us understanding and knowledge of you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this verse is very often misused. One of the reasons it's misused is because people are using versions of the Bible, and those versions, uh, again, we won't take a whole lot of time now, but uh, uh, they use a whole different process of what they call translating. It's not really a, a translation. Translation is where you take something from one place and that same thing is put in a different place. And so when it's used for uh, languages, you're taking something from one language and you're taking that same thing over into another language. You're not changing it and putting it into your own words in the other language. You're not trying to necessarily convey what you think the speaker was attempting to say. And to, to think that God was trying to say something is, is a very arrogant uh, thought process. And so God was never trying to say anything. God said things. And it wasn't that God couldn't figure out how to communicate with mankind. God knows how to communicate with us. And so we don't need to put our own spin, our own thoughts overlaying his we just let need to let his word be his word and so a lot of these so-called translations which are not translations at all they're they're correctly called versions they'll say something like i can do all things through christ who strengtheneth me but that's not the word there the word is which and, and so it's very it's very important that we read the word as it is and let it say what it says and so they'll use that verse, say, I can, I can do anything, I can do everything I want, and uh, Jesus will strengthen me in that. And that's not what the Bible says. If you're doing wrong, God's not going to strengthen you and help you to do wrong. And he's not going uh, to propel you in that direction. Uh, he'll put speed bumps and obstacles in your way to do wrong. <clears throat> and uh, so that's not what is being said here. The the context and everything as we look at this, God is using the Apostle Paul to write this, uh, and a good deal of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, he wrote from prison. When he was out of prison, he was busy about the work of the ministry, and he would go to a different city, different town, start spreading the gospel there. The people would get upset with the message, and oftentimes he would get thrown into jail. They try to get him to stop, and so God would use that time and say, okay, uh, get some writing instruments, and I'm going to write a letter. I'm going to use you to write a letter. And so Paul, these are not Paul's words. These are God's words, and God used Paul to give them to us, just, just as you might use a pen to write a note on a piece of paper and give that to somebody else. We don't give the credit for that writing to the pen. The credit goes to the writer, and the writer of the Bible is God the Holy Spirit. And so the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And that word which, W-H-I-C-H, refers to an object or to a thing. Uh, it doesn't refer to a person. If we were to use a pronoun for a person, then we would say, who strengtheneth me? Or who strengthens me? But it doesn't say who. It says which, which means it's referring to a thing or things. And if we look back in this very passage, <clears throat> the Bible tells us I can do all things. And so um, the things that strengthen me. So really it could, it could read, and I'm not changing the meaning of it. I'm just saying this is how we might word things today. 
uh, I can do all things which strengthen me through Christ. And that's not changing the meaning or, or the reading of it at all. Um, it's just putting it in an order that in which we would speak today. A lot of uh, English has changed over the last 400 years. And the way people speak now is a little bit different than the way people used to speak. And the, the syntax of our, uh, of our sentences uh, has changed a little bit. Vocabulary has changed uh, considerably. The definition of words. And so it's good to have a good old dictionary that uh, is not full of modern slang. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, you can find one that Webster wrote back in the 1800s. You're on a good track. There and so as we look at this, he's not saying I can do anything and everything I want, and Jesus will strengthen me. It's not saying I can face everything. It's saying that if I have to do something that will strengthen me, then I can do that through Christ. And and so we we have to realize sometimes hardships are there not to make things difficult for us, but they are there to strengthen us. A football team doesn't just show up uh, on the day of the game and figure things out at that point. They don't just show up on the day of the game and say, okay, let's do some exercises so we can be strong enough to face the opposing team. No, they spend months and months uh, exercising, practicing different maneuvers and plays, and, and those things are there. The coach isn't being mean to them when he says, I want you to do some push-ups. The coach isn't being mean to them when he says, okay, you're gonna run some laps around the field. The coach isn't being mean to them when he says, I want you to do some exercises through this set of tires that's laid out on the ground and you're going to run through those and pick your feet up and and raise your knees high as you're running and and hold on to this football and don't let go of it and do some weight training and and uh, just uh, all manner of exercises and difficulties and when he's yelling at him and blowing the whistle and everything that's not meanness and that's not cruelty those things are designed to strengthen them and so the coach wants them to know, you know, he believes they can do that many push-ups or he wouldn't ask them to. And so he also needs them to believe that they can do that. He believes they can be competitive against the opposing team or he wouldn't ask them to compete. And, and so uh, when we face things in life, we need to understand none of these things have taken God by surprise. They have not caught him off guard. In fact, many of those things that we go through and that we face, God puts there for our good. He puts them there to strengthen us. He puts them there to hone us. He puts them there to build something in us that then he can use um, for his honor and for his glory. If we look back uh, at the context here, and if we go back to... Um, uh, <clears throat> verse uh, uh, 10, he says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. And he says, You've done things to take care of me. He's talking to the church in Colossae, the, the Colossian Christians. I'm sorry, the Philippian. He's in, talking to the church in Philippi and the Philippian Christians. And evidently they had uh, sent some goods to help him uh, while he was in jail. And I know sometimes he would write and say, can you send me some paper and some writing material? Uh, can you send me these books? And can you send me this? And can you send me that? And, and so there was more than one occasion where churches would send uh, like a care package, a love offering, if you will, uh, to help the Apostle Paul out during those times. And so he says, uh, here at the last, you've done it again. And um, not that you were lax in it before, uh, you just didn't always have an opportunity to do so. And he's shown appreciation for that in verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He says, not that I'm asking for more, not that I, I feel like I'm missing out on something. I've learned that whatever state I'm, I find myself in, whether it's the state of Kentucky or the state of, no, it's not that kind of state, but whatever condition I'm in, whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. He says, uh, I've, I've just, I've, that's something I've had to learn. You know, some people say, well, you do real well in, in, in a hardship. I just don't think I can do that. 
That's not something that necessarily comes natural to anybody. That's something we learn. How do we learn it? By going through it. And so Paul uh, goes on and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, verse 12 says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. He said, I know how to, how to live without anything. I know how to live there. And he says, I know how to live with many things. Um, when I have nothing, he said, I know what that's like. And I know how to, I know how to behave myself there. And when I have abundance, I know how to behave myself there. You know, some people, they don't know how to behave themselves when things are going well. And it seems like they only know how to, uh, how to move through life when things are going horribly. But once they start having a little bit of success, boy, they start making all sorts of bad decisions. You know, it's hard to buy things you ought not to buy when you don't have any money. And, and some people say, well, I, you know, I, I, I barely have enough money to put groceries on the table. And I work and I work and I work and it's all I can do to keep the lights turned on. And then they get a, they get a nice promotion and a big raise at work. And instead of using that money wisely and correctly as God would have them, they say, oh, I've got some extra money now. I can go to the casino. And so they don't know how to handle success. Uh, I can buy uh, some things that I shouldn't buy, and whether it's uh, drugs or alcohol or, or whatever. They, they start using the money in an incorrect and improper way. And so they don't know how to abound. They know how to be a base. They, they can behave themselves there. And really, that's not something that they themselves are doing. It's kind of imposed upon them. And, and so, but the Apostle Paul says, I know how to live in a, in a state of being abased. And I know how to live in a state of abundance, of, of, of abounding. And he says, everywhere and in all things. How do you know, how, do you know how to do that, Paul? How is it that, that uh, you've learned how to do that? He said, well, everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I remember my granddad saying uh, when, when there might be a day of uh, well-attended services, and he'd say, I'm happy, but I'm not satisfied. And what was he saying there? I, you know, if we had 180 people in here, boy, that'd be a oh, happy day. Uh, but it, would you be satisfied with that? No, I'd want more. Um, and if we got to the point where we had to have two services and because each each was just packed. And uh, then what do we do? Would you be happy then? Oh, I'd be happy. Would you be satisfied? No, I would still want more. Uh, it might be time to make use of some of the empty land out back and build a larger building and use this for something different or, or tear it down uh, to make room for a parking. Uh, but uh, and so we can be happy with those things but not necessarily satisfied. I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And we've got to understand that not only is, sometimes we think, well, God's, God's will is for all of us to be successful and God's will is for us to never suffer want and to never be in a situation where we have a need. And that's not, that's not true. There are times when God wants us to go without. There are times, and the Bible says that uh, there's times where we should be fasting. And there's different things you can fast from. It's not just food. Uh, if you do decide to, to fast uh, from food and you have some health issues, make sure you find, uh, check with your doctor and find a way that you can do that in a safe way uh, and, and properly. But uh, uh, <clears throat> there are times when God would have us go without. It was God's will for Job to go without for a period of time. And in that time, in that difficulty, while Job was facing that, he was facing the loss of all of his wealth. He was facing the death of all of his children. He was facing the, uh, the fact that his friends had turned against him and came and leveled false accusations against him. He was facing... Uh, the lack of support from his wife when she said, uh, dost thou retain that integrity, curse God and die, as Satan moved her against him uh, to try to destroy his relationship with God. And, and so he, he's learning now 
how to go without. And he, he asked his wife, he said, wait a minute. He said, should we accept wonderful things at the hand of God and then be upset when those wonderful things are taken away from us? And so he was learning not just how to abound, but he was learning how to live in a, a state of, a, uh, of being abased and being instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then that leads us to verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And on the other side of Job's trials, he certainly came out stronger than when he went in. His relationship to God was that much better than it was before all those trials came his way. His closeness and his faithfulness to God his level of blessings were so much higher on the other side. He got double the amount of wealth uh, restored to him. He didn't just get back the money that he had lost with a little bit of interest. He got the, back the wealth that he had lost with 100% interest. And then uh, 10 more children uh, were born to he and his wife. And somebody once said, well, why didn't he get double the children? Well, he had only been separated from the first 10. And <clears throat> so he, you know, somebody said to me they, when my dad passed away and then when my mom passed away, they said, we're sorry about your loss. I didn't lose them. I know exactly where they are. And they had both placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their savior. And I know where they are. We're separated from each other right now, but I haven't lost them. They're, they've not been misplaced. And I know where their bodies have been laid to rest. I know those graves very soon when Jesus comes back will be emptied along with many, many others uh, that have gone on before us and now form that great cloud of witness talked about in Hebrews chapter 12. But this verse is very often misused <clears throat> thinking that God will strengthen us to face anything and everything. God will strengthen us to face the things to which he has brought us with the intent uh, or God will help us to do those things when those things are brought our way with the intent to strengthen us. And it's the things that strengthen us. It's the hardships that strengthen us. It's those difficulties. And when we run from them, they're not having an effect. When, when somebody hates to do push-ups and they find out, well, the coach is going to make us do push-ups at the next practice, I'll just skip that practice. They don't benefit from that. They don't gain from that. Uh, I had to do some, some physical therapy exercises several years ago. Uh, I had injured my back at work, and they sent me to physical therapy to, uh, to help with that. And I asked the physical therapist, I said, how soon, from because I was feeling different muscles gain strength. And I said, how soon will these muscles lose strength after I quit exercising? And they said, immediately. They said that the next day, your muscles are already starting to, to lose strength. And, and so if you want to gain strength, build strength, it takes a consistent, ongoing practice of certain exercises and things. And so when we, when we see difficulties, what we need to do is face them, ask God for help, ask God for direction, <clears throat> and ask God you know, to help us accomplish what he is wanting to accomplish in our life. Let's close tonight with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for being a God who loves us, who wants to provide uh, the needs that we have, and who realizes, even better than we do, the need for strength to face different things. And Lord, as, we, <clears throat> as you know what is in our future, we thank you for providing the things that we need, the strength and abilities to face those things on down the road in the future. Help us to to make good use of the trials, of the difficulties that you bring our way that are there to build strength in us so that when we do face the, the big event, we have the strength, we have everything necessary to be more than conquerors in you. We pray that uh, you help us to study your word, to let it say what it says and mean what it means. Uh, bless our services on Sunday. We pray that uh, you help them to be well attended. Prepare our hearts for the message we'll hear at the time, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.